Hello and welcome to this NCFE provider webinar on English as an additional language strategies for embedding support. My name is Charmaine Phelps and I'm the curriculum officer for functional skills maths. My role is to support centres through the planning, onboarding and CPD process for NCFE cash qualifications, focusing specifically on maths functional skills. If you would like the slides from this recording, please email charmainephelps at ncfe.org.uk. The objective of this session is to explore strategies to support English as an additional language learners with functional skills maths. We'll cover generic strategies, number, uh, fractions, decimals, percentages, ratio and proportion, measure, reasonable adjustments and some useful links and finish with a summary. So first of all, we'll take a look at some generic strategies. There are many acronyms surrounding learners who have English as an additional language. We'll go through each description in turn. So first language, home language, that's the language that's first learned or the language used by the family in the home. EAL, English as an additional language. EFL, English as a foreign language. ESOL, is English for speakers of other languages. Quite often that's a specific qualification. ESL is English as a second language. ELL is English language learner. And bilingual means somebody who has developed two languages equally. It's useful to have an understanding of the different stages of learning English, as depending on where your learners are on their journey will depend not just on the level of support that they will need, but also how your expectations are set, so that undue pressure is not put on learners to participate orally in lessons before they're ready. So to begin with, there will be a silent period, so be conscious of this when directing questions to your learners. Next, learners will begin to use nonverbal gestures to communicate. Then learners might echo single words and phrases before using single words as confidence and vocabulary increases. Then learners will begin to use chunks of speech, for instance, home time, etc., before using sentences made up of keywords, and then eventually developing more control of functional language so that they can begin to use extended phrases or simple sentences. Tips for supporting EAL learners. Learn names. That's obvious in, in any classroom situation, but if you have a learner who has a name that's particularly difficult to pronounce, be sure you learn how to pronounce your learners' names correctly and then use your learners' names so that other members of the class can also learn how to pronounce names accurately too. It's important that you create a welcoming and positive classroom environment where learners are encouraging of one another. So EAL learners are not afraid to participate for fear of ridicule. There are tips for creating a positive environment in the recorded webinar on engaging learners with maths that are linked to on a later slide. One-on-one -on -one assistance. Some EAL learners may not answer voluntarily or, or ask for help when needed. They might smile and nod to be polite without actually understanding. So individual coaching may be necessary, which would be easier if their desk was positioned nearer to yours. Peer partners, it can be helpful to assign a responsible learner to help your EAL learner, especially if they know the same first language. An interpreter can help to smooth out any misunderstandings. So this may be a paid member of staff or it could be a volunteer parent or adult associated with your centre. Culture, it's important to have an awareness of your learner's culture to prevent any misunderstandings, but also to let your learner know that their culture is respected so that they feel more at home. This could be embedded in mass activities when devising contexts for mass questions. Visual prompts and practical activities. 
Many functional skills learners benefit from the use of physical objects, visual representations and practical activities to illustrate underpinning skills. However, for the more contextualized functional skills questions, your EAL learners may require further visual prompts and practical activities to help them to understand the problems that they're given. Differentiation. Your EAL learners may benefit from differentiated activities as their English language skills are still developing. When practicing underpinning skills, this is less important aside from the usual differentiation by ability of the class regardless of the first language spoken. However, when you begin to work on wordy contextualized questions, you may need to consider simplifying the language and using more visual prompts. Non-threatening participation. If your learner feels welcomed and valued by following the steps above, it will help to encourage your EAL learners to participate actively in lesson without the fear of ridicule. As a general rule with all learners, it's important not to put them on the spot to participate when pair or group work may take the pressure off a little and lead to less embarrassment. Cooperative learning. In the Engaging Learners with Maths webinar, there is an explanation of participation quizzes, which is a form of cooperative learning. Cooperative learning or group work activities promote peer interaction, which helps the development of language and the learning of concepts and content. It is important to mix up the groups so that EAL learners can benefit from different English language role models. EAL learners can participate with greater confidence when working in small teams. Follow established rules. All learners need to understand and follow class rules from the beginning, and it's important to be consistent and fair. Class rules need to be laid out from the outset to avoid misunderstandings and discipline issues which will detract from the learning. You may need to provide visual aids and model expectations to support your EAL learners. However, once they understand what is expected, all learners should be held accountable, and your EAL learners are no exception. While you may be giving your EAO learners more support, which is necessary for them in order for them to have a quality of access to the lesson, there's a fine line to tread so that other learners don't feel that EAL learners are receiving preferential treatment. You may be familiar with an illustration showing attendees at a football match being given different blocks to stand on in order to get the same view. If you're not familiar with this image, you can Google equality versus equity and there's an image that will come up which may be useful for you to display in your setting. We'll take a look at keyword understanding. I've adapted a resource from the skills workshop that I'll link to in a later slide that can help to ensure your learners understand the terms that they're using. In John Holt's 1964 book, How Children Fail, he stated, I feel I understand something if I can do some at least of the following. State it in my own words, give examples of it, recognize it in various guises and circumstances, see connections between it and other facts or ideas, make, of use, make use of it in various ways, foresee some of its consequences and state its opposite or converse. This list is only the beginning, but it may help us in the future to find out what our students really know, as opposed to what they can give the appearance of knowing. Their real learning as opposed to their apparent learning. So here is a resource to look at the keyword understanding. Uh, we'll look at multiplication. So using John Holt's list, we've got the various uh, ways that we can see if we understand the keyword. And here we have a learner response. So with multiplication, explaining what it means, increasing an amount by a certain number of lots of itself, give example of it. So four multiplied by eight means eight lots of four, so 32. Other words that have the same meaning are times, uh, the product, lots of, groups of, connections to other learning. We have for area, you need to multiply length by width connects to adding as you can add up so many lots of the same number. How would you make use of it? If I was having a party and wanted to give three glasses of drink to each of 20 guests, I would do 20 times three equals 60 drinks. If each drink was 250 milliliters, I would do 60 times 250 to find the total amount of drink to buy. What would be the consequences of not using this? 
uh, if I did not use the multiplication, I'd have to add up 250 plus 250 60 times, and that would take longer. Uh, can you state its opposite division? And you could use a keyword understanding um, for any maths uh, keyword. So now we'll take a look at math specific issues that your EAL learners may face. When it comes to the language of numbers, it's important to coordinate and discuss your learners progress with their English teacher. Left to right, many learners may not be familiar with English lettering and may be used to different ways of reading writing on a page other than from left to right, which could impact on the speed of progress they make or mistakes due to reading in a different direction. Spelling and homophones. English spelling can raise issues for learners. Homophones are words that sound the same but have different meanings. So for instance, there might be one, as in I want a race, W-O-N, and one, O-N-E, or two, uh, meaning the number two, T-W-O, or two, meaning T-O-O, as well. Eight is another one, um, eight the number, E-I-G-H-T, and eight, I ate a pie. I ate eight pies um, could be a very confusing um, sentence for your EAL learners. There are also words that don't make sense. So if we think about our system of counting and how it could cause confusion, so the, the teens compared with 11 and 12, and we say 20 and 30 rather than 2t and 3t. Pronunciation. Pronunciation of numbers can be a challenge for learners. For instance, the pronunciation of V and W can be reversed. The sound may not be present and word endings may not usually be heard in other languages. Commas versus full stops. With English numbers, we use a comma to show a split between thousands. However, in other languages, a comma is used as a decimal point. So as an example, the number uh, 32,152 could be read as 32.152. When writing money in English, a full stop is used between pounds and pence. Four pound 50 is four pounds and 50 pence. However, in another language, in other languages, a comma is used with money. For instance, five euros 32. Then we have absent words. Other languages can have special words for place value that don't appear in English. In Hindi, lek means 100,000. The repetition of 100 in a string of numbers can confuse some learners. Rounding and estimation. Rounding. From level one, learners need to approximate by rounding to a whole number or to one or two decimal places. Round has a number of different meanings, which will need to be clear to learners. A strategy for this might be to ask learners to pick out shapes which are round or curved from a selection of 2D shapes. Learners could then identify how many shapes there are and be shown how to round that number to, say, the nearest 10. A practical activity could be to ask learners to use shopping receipts to round each cost to the nearest pound. Estimation. At level two, learners must carry out calculations with numbers up to one million, including strategies to check answers, including estimation and approximation. The first issue with this is the language. There are a number of words that might be used in place of estimate, such as about, roughly, or approximately. To help with this, you could show examples of questions using different vocabulary with suggested answers. You could ask learners to regularly estimate a rough answer before doing a calculation, as this will not only help them with knowledge of estimation, but also be a good way to check if their answers make sense. Accuracy. Learners from cultures where accuracy is highly valued may struggle with the idea of estimation. 
So it's important to reinforce this concept and instances when it might be used in real life and in their work to help sense check answers. Operations. The four number operations have their own symbols and may be written from left to right or in columns. All learners need to know that addition and multiplication are commutative. So it doesn't matter which order you do a calculation with solely additions or solely multiplications, as the answer will be the same. Whereas with subtraction and division, the number sentences must be written in the correct order or their meaning will change. Bid mass introduces another complicating factor for all learners if calculations require more than one operation, which need to be carried out in the right order. There are many different ways a question may ask for the different operations. We'll take each in turn now. So addition, you can have add, more than, total, sum, all together, and, plus, increase. An example might be, what is five and four all together? Subtraction, other words could be subtract, minus, deduct, less than, difference between, decrease. So as an example, what is the difference between 46 and 79? Multiplication, you might have multiply, lots of, times, product of. For, as an example, what is the product of 16 and seven? Division. You have divide, share, go into, as an example, uh, share 30 oranges out between six people. Now we'll take a look at fractions, decimals, percentages, ratio and proportion. So when it comes to fractions, decimals and percentages, the first thing we'll take a look at is irregular names. A small number of fractions have non-regular names, such as a half, a third, and a quarter. After that, they tend to follow a pattern of adding th after the number, as in one sixth and one, uh, but then one fifth and one twelfth are also exceptions. This links with place value, as after the decimal point, so 0 0.1 is one tenth, and 0 0.01 is one one hundredth and learners will need to make this link between decimals and fractions. Uh, but as we've already mentioned, in some languages, the is actually quite hard to say. Simplest form, learners will need to know that a fraction is not a proper fraction unless it is in its lowest or simplest form. An activity to help with this could be to have various equivalent fractions on cards that could be matched alongside the simplest form. For instance, three sixths is the same as four eighths, which is the same as a half. We also have the comma versus full stop issue that we've covered previously. And with percentages, we have off versus of. The main area of difficulty for many EAL learners is centered on the use of off and of in exam questions as they're written very similarly, causing learners to get the wrong answer if they don't realize how many Fs there are. For instance, 20% of 40 pound is eight pound, whereas 20% off 40 pound would give 32 pounds as an answer. Strategies and teaching activities that could support your learners with uh, fractions, decimals and percentages might be to take a collection of coloured objects. Um, so in the, your classroom, you might have uh, different coloured um, pens or pencils. Or if you're teaching your learners remotely, you can ask them for what they have around the house. You could ask learners to count how many there are in total. Then, for instance, say how many of these are green? What fraction is this of the total amount? Then ask learners what fraction of these objects, um, perhaps sweet uh, smarties, what fraction are uh, blue. Learners might also be asked to cut out or be given paper shapes such as circles, rectangles or squares. You could show and or ask learners to divide the shapes into halves, to quarters or other common fractions by measuring, colouring 
or labeling. Another activity, and you can, you can find this on YouTube, uh, is to build a fraction wall. So cut a length of paper into equal strips and then fold them over. So you have you know, one fold would give you halves, uh, two folds will give you thirds. If you fold it again, you, know, you can show quarters and your learners can then build up their own fraction wall to see how the different fractions relate to one another. You could try using rulers and measuring tapes to practice using decimal numbers in context. So you might measure a pen or a pencil, which could be 13.5 um, you know, centimeters long. You could ask learners to choose three objects in the room and measure them using decimals in their answers. And then perhaps for higher level learners, ask them to convert those decimals into fractions. You could ask learners to bring in uh, various promotional leaflets that show percentages and other special offers for use in class. These can be used for price comparisons. For instance, when you see 50% off, is that better value than buy one, get one free? Now we'll take a look at ratio. The colon that's used for ratio in English is used as the division sign in much of the rest of the world. This means that learners may initially interpret two to three as two divided by three, because they may not be familiar with the division symbol and may interpret the colon as a division symbol. Learners can be shown that ratios are closely linked to fractions. So in a ratio of one to three, there are four parts in total. So if we're, we're thinking of squash, uh, orange squash mixed in the ratio of one to three in terms of the concentrate to water, there would be one quarter of the concentrated orange squash and three quarters water. Ratios like fractions should always be in their lowest form. So six to eight would be written as three to four. Bar models may help your learners to visualize this. Ratio comes into play in practical examples of direct proportion, such as changing a recipe or mixing cement. When scaling the recipe up or down, the ratio must stay the same, otherwise the recipe or mix will not work. Proportion can also be used to evaluate prices on supermarket websites. So for instance, if a 1.2 kilogram bag, bag of carrots costs £1.50, but carrots are 89p per kilogram, then it would be better valued by loose carrots when you compare the unitary price per kilogram. I recently de delivered a webinar on ratio that may be useful for you, and a link to the recordings is on a later slide. Now we'll take a look at measure. The metric system is a decimal system using base 10. It's built around a one litre cube. This cube measures 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres, which is 1,000 cubic centimetres. When filled with plain water, this will hold exactly one litre of water, 1,000 millilitres, which will weigh one kilogram, 1,000 grams. The imperial system never uses 10 as a base. It uses 8, 12, 14, 16, or 20, depending on which conversion is required. In the UK, lengths became metric first, but the longer lengths of distance have has never been converted from miles to kilometers. So EAL learners will need to be familiar with this imperial measurement. Length and distance. Practical activities can be the most effective way of introducing learners to an unfamiliar measuring system. For instance, many small items in the classroom or in your learner's room if they're learning from home or in their office if they're learning at work uh, could be measured using a ruler and then a chart could be drawn to record lengths in each system, metric and imperial. Learners can then use this information to order the objects in terms of size. The language of length comparison will also need to be covered. For instance, small, smaller, smallest, big, bigger, biggest, short, shorter, shortest. 
long, longer, longest. Learners also need to know that long and short can refer to time as well as uh, measures of length or distance. In the UK, we tend to give height in feet and inches. So another activity you could try would be to work in pairs and measure height in both metric and imperial. You might like to reinforce area and perimeter by measuring the area of your learner's room or classroom or office and calculating the area of carpet needed for it, as well as the length of new skirting that would go around the edges. The skirting would be the perimeter and the carpet would be the area. Calculating distances on maps can also help learners to appreciate that miles are longer than kilometres. So they can expect mileage to be a smaller number than the equivalent in kilometres. So as an activity, you could ask learners to calculate how far from your centre it is to their house in miles and kilometres. They would need an understanding of scale before they could complete this if they were doing it using a map rather than some sort of tracking uh, device on their phone. Weight. It's very useful to have analog weighing scales in the classroom when teaching weight. Although digital scales are more accurate, it's easier to see the metric and imperial systems on a single scale. And being able to read from a number line is also a useful skill. You might ask your learners to weigh a small number of objects using firstly the system that they're familiar with and then the new one. So you might start them off using metric and then uh, ask them to measure their objects using the imperial system. And hopefully this will help them to understand how the two system works. Uh, these results could then be recorded in a chart and comparisons could be made. Again, in order to make comparisons, the language needs to be explored. So you have heavy, heavier, heaviest, light, lighter and lightest. As the majority of people in the UK prefer to express their weight in stones and pounds, learners might like to know theirs too. Learners can either weigh themselves on scales or if they know their own weight, they can convert their metric weight to imperial by dividing by 6.5 as there are roughly 6.5 kilograms in a stone. They may prefer to do this privately rather than as a shared or group activity. Capacity. Although millilitres and litres have been used for over 30 years in the UK, there are still many examples of the old imperial system of fluid ounces, pints and gallons in evidence. For instance, milk and beer is still available in pints in the UK. Cars are usually quoted as doing a certain number of miles to the gallon. An activity for this might be to get a collection of different sized and shaped containers, including measuring jugs, bottles and cartons, uh, and some water can be useful when teaching learners about capacity, as it can be difficult to judge comparative sizes of containers. Comparative language is also important to cover, such as more or less, or higher or lower volume. Some measuring jugs also have markers for weights or of ingredients, such as flour or rice. There are roughly 4.5 litres in a gallon, so learners can convert from one to the other by multiplying or dividing by 4.5. Using the metric system, it's very easy to find the capacity or volume of the 3D shape if given its dimensions, because 1,000 cubic centimetres is one litre. The same cannot be said of the imperial system. So we'll take a look at reasonable adjustments uh, for EAL learners. To find our reasonable adjustments policy, you can go to Qualhub, click on policies and documents, and from there, scroll until you find forms. Look for notification of access arrangements and reasonable adjustments. And then it will open up the page with the guidance documents and a form to request reasonable adjustments. When it comes to learners with English as an additional language, 
you don't need to notify us to give an additional 10% and access to a bilingual translation dictionary and no supporting evidence is required for inspection purposes. The use of a bilingual translation dictionary with up to 10% extra time must reflect the learner's normal way of working and it's only to be used in assessments by learners whose first language is not English, Irish or Welsh and who entered the UK less than three years ago, including holiday periods. Extra time must not be awarded to a learner using a bilingual translation dictionary who does not meet the above criteria or in order to compensate for difficulties in reading and writing in English. The translation of assessment materials or the learner's answers into or from the learner's first language is not allowed. So all of the information on reasonable adjustments is in this policy. So if you have any questions or queries about that, you can refer to that specific policy. Some resources that might be useful for you, I've put on this page here, um, some useful links. If you need to pause this recording and write them down, you can. If you prefer to request the slides, um, that's obviously available to you. Just send me an email. So the first one here, uh, the British Council uh, Reading Football Fans, it's a reading resource, um, but it's also about recognising numbers, so that can be quite useful. The Reading Rockets link has useful ideas for creating a positive and welcoming classroom environment for your EAL learners. The Skills Workshop uh, PDF is the, the PDF that I mentioned earlier about the keyword checks. And this uh, ESOL British Council uh, PDF is a very useful um, document that you can work through and there's activities in it to help you with supporting your EAL learners specifically with maths. Uh, the recording for engaging learners with maths and also ratio and proportion are here. So if you need any more information about ratio and proportion, um, and there's also lots of uh, ideas for engaging your learners, um, be they EAL, EAL learners or simply learners who are perhaps a little bit um, less motivated than others, uh, you can take a look at those particular recordings. So we'll summarise what we've looked at uh, during this session. The most important thing that you can do for your EAL learners is to create a welcoming and supportive classroom environment so they feel comfortable asking for help and contributing to your sessions as their language develops. With number, you need to be aware of differences with the language surrounding numbers, such as words with different meanings that sound the same, as well as there being many different ways to say the same thing and also the use of commas or full stops being used differently to how your EAL learner is used to. With fractions, decimals, percentages, ratio and proportion, you need an awareness of irregular names, off versus of, and learners confusing a colon with division and not being able, not being used to seeing the division symbol. Learners need to have an understanding of imperial measures and to be able to convert from metric to imperial and vice versa. Practical activities with your learners will help to develop an understanding of this. If you do need to apply reasonable adjustments, there's a form on Qualhub. However, you can add 10% extra time and use a bilingual dictionary without informing us if the requirements mentioned previously are met. The nature of functional skills questions does mean that your learners will need a fairly sound grasp of the English language in order to understand the maths needed to solve contextualized problems. So bear this in mind when deciding if your learners are ready to sit their maths assessments. Upcoming CPD support is listed here. So in May, we have approaching of functional skills assessments for English and maths or you can go to our events page on Qualhub that is linked here for the next CPD that's coming up. Here are the key contacts if you need individual support. For training and development, you have access to myself and Patricia in the curriculum team. 
If you'd like to discuss additional qualifications, each centre has a dedicated account manager, although if you don't know who that is, then you can contact anybody from the business development team. When it comes to registering learners and uploading results or help with surpass, then our customer support team can help with your queries. I do hope you found this session helpful. Thank you so much for your time today and from everybody at NCFE. Stay safe and take care. Thank you.